Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of Divine Truth. The interview was held on the 5th of September 2013 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is Session 3, Part 1. Well, this is the third session of our Divine Truth uh, Frequently Asked Question series. And in this session, we're going to cover uh, a lot more information uh, that we've been covering over the last two sessions as well. The, remember, in the first session, we covered the basics about Divine Truth, what it is, and the, the fact that it's God's truth. And also, we covered some basic questions about Divine Truth itself in comparison to p facing personal truth. In this session, uh, or in the, in the session after that, we also discussed the first seven qualities of divine truth. In the first session, we introduced those qualities, and then in the second session, we discussed the first seven qualities in two facets. The first facet was what is the quality or attribute of divine truth, and then what it looks like in our personal life if we really feel it. In this particular session, we're going to cover the next seven questions about divine truth. So questions from, or, or qualities from eight to 14 of, that we first introduced in the first session. And we're going to look at the two facets again of these, eight, these seven qualities in that we're going to look at what the quality is and also what the expression of it looks like if we feel it in our day-to-day -day lives. So they're the primary things we're going to do in this session. Thanks for your time and in joining myself and Mary. Myself and Mary are going to be doing this. And uh, we're down in New South Wales at the moment. So it's a different backdrop, uh, as you can see. <laughs> and uh, and we will be basically covering these, hopefully we'll cover the, the 14 questions that we want to cover today. Thanks, Darlin. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Quality eight. What do you mean when you say divine truth results in a fearless existence? Well, because divine truth is God's truth, obviously it exposes anything that's false in the universe. Anything that, fault, that is false creates fear. So every time we believe something that's false, we actually finish up having fear surrounding that particular thing. And that applies whether the thing is material in its nature, so it's a false belief about the universe itself, or whether it's spiritual in its nature, in, in other words, a false belief about our spiritual existence, mm -hmm. or whether it's emotional in its nature, a false, truth, a false belief about our emotions. So all of these false beliefs create fear, and divine truth exposes fear. In other words, it reduces fear. In fact, once we understand all of God's truths on any subject, we have no fear at all left on that particular subject. In addition, once we get rid of fear, when we become at one with God, we've gotten rid of fear. Once we get rid of fear, we are open to accepting new truth without fear being the primary influence upon our acceptance of new truth. In other words, we are, we are now no longer preventing the absorption of the truth of the universe from entering us. Mm -hmm. When we're afraid, we're always trying to prevent or resist the absorption of truth. Whereas when we uh, have no fear at all anymore, we no longer prevent the absorption of new truth. We're no longer afraid of change. We're no longer afraid of having to accept a new belief that is contrary to our old belief. So we no longer hold on to fear-based beliefs, but we also, because divine truth results in a fearless existence, we no longer prevent the absorption of new truths through our fear. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the primary effects of divine truth. And it's one of the qualities of divine truth. So if we sort of had a look at that, how that would look like in terms of general actions, we would see that if we truly understood something as God understands it, we would no longer have any fear associated with the subject. Mm -hmm. We would only have the truth on the subject. And so therefore we would know everything we need to know about it. Now, if we give an example, when, when flight was first considered by humankind, they had a lot of fear associated with flight. You could fall from a great height yep. and therefore die. And there was no seeming ways of protecting oneself from fall. And so therefore there was no seeming protection against the fall. And because we had all of these fears associated with it, 
we were also very resistive to discovering new facts about flight. Mm -hmm. Once mankind started to get over these fears, or we had a few brave people on the planet mm -hmm. who were willing to try to find out new truth even though they had that fear, what eventually happened was that we discovered the laws about flight, which, were, which are now called the laws of aerodynamics, the laws that control the, the ability to have heavier than air flight. Once those laws were discovered, there was less fear. Mm -hmm. And once those laws were engaged in a, in a way that we knew that they worked in a certain manner, then there is very little to no fear at all. So if you look at what we do now, the majority of us, in the, particularly in the Western world, fly overseas or inside of our countries all the time yeah. without giving any consideration to it aside from jumping in a bus. It's just a bus that flies. Yeah. And we don't have any worry about falling to the earth, have very little concern about it happening because we have a lot of confidence in the law. And we have the right to have a lot of confidence in the law because as long as we engage the law in a perfect manner, we will be completely safe. Mm -hmm. And so this is an example how divine truth results in a more fearless existence. Yeah. So when we first begin the discovery of flight, there was a lot of fear associated with it and only a few brave people would engage it. Now that we know most of the laws involved with flight, with heavier than air transportation, we now engage the laws almost on a daily basis without any fear at all. Yeah. And that's an example how divine truth results in a fearless existence. That's a physical example. If we look at uh, a, a, an example regarding our spiritual existence, yep. if there is a spiritual teaching that results in more fear internally, then it means that it can't be divine truth because divine truth would result in a less fearless existence from a spiritual perspective. So we need to understand that anything that we believe in spiritually that seems to create more fear or exacerbate the fear we already feel, and that is obviously not harmonious with love as well, as we've already discussed, then, then we could no longer really accept it as a potential truth of God. Yeah. It might be mankind's ideas of what actually occurs, but it wouldn't be a potential truth of God while there's so much fear associated with it. I think that's a really um, interesting point because we often, like common society, often associates God with fear. Mm. We even have the phrase, God-fearing, I'm a good God-fearing God person. person. <laughs> exactly. And really what you're saying, that it's only falsehood that creates fear. Exactly. So if anything in our spiritual lives is controlling us through fear, then we, we can basically say this is not a truth from exactly. what you're saying. So the whole concept that we should fear God is not a truth. Mm -hmm. God does not want us to fear God. God wants to be able to have a love-based relationship and fear and love are actually almost like opposites. They cannot exist in the same space at the same time. When we're afraid of something, we certainly cannot love it. Yeah. And so if we are afraid of God, then we certainly cannot love God and certainly would also block the reception of God's love into our own soul as well as a result of our fear of God. Mm -hmm. In addition, the fear is not based on truth. So God's love cannot flow into us while we have an untruth in us or, uh, or a belief that's untrue in us about God herself. Yeah. Yeah. To, to have the love flow, we must release the fear-based position and by experiencing it and releasing it, so that we get to the truth-based position, which is there is no fear in love. Mm -hmm. And so therefore there is no fear of God yeah. uh, as a result. So any teaching that causes us to believe that we should fear God is already out of harmony with divine, God's truth, mm -hmm. God, God, the reality of God's, of God's nature. In addition, we can see that there are many false beliefs on the planet spiritually from a, from a religious perspective that are completely out of harmony with divine truth if you just examine them from the point of view of fear. Yep. So the whole hell, fire, torment teaching doctrine that exists in Christianity and, and in other religious faiths mm -hmm. is while it, it sounds good or it sounds like it, the wicked will be punished in a certain way and that might sound good to somebody who thinks they're righteous, um, the reality is it's a, it's a fear-based perception of the universe and therefore it cannot be the reality of the universe. Mm -hmm. It has to be related to a false belief.
because divine truth results in a fearless existence. Once we know the truth about the entire spiritual existence, including the spiritual dimensions, we wouldn't be worried about a hellfire in which we could be tormented forever and ever and ever without any, any let, let up. Mm -hmm. The same goes with the belief that there is some kind of uh, deviant mastermind of the universe, mm -hmm. a Satan, the devil, if you want to call it. Again, it's a very fear-based belief. And any person who's steeped in that belief is often steeped in the fear that the belief, con that the belief uh, creates. And as a result, uh, it's not in harmony with divine truth. It's mm -hmm. a, a fear-based belief. And so therefore, it cannot be the truth. This is one of the qualities of divine truth. It yep. cannot be God's truth if it is a fear-based belief. So just this one aspect of seeing something as a fear-based belief can help us throw away lots and lots of false doctrines for a start. It can help us throw away lots of false concepts about God. Yeah. It can also help us throw away lots of false concepts about ourselves, our future existence, our future life, and also about our physical existence. So in terms of how we see the material world, mm -hmm. it helps us throw away a lot of false concepts about the material world. So we no longer become we're no longer afraid of spiders when we're in harmony with divine truth. We're no longer afraid of snakes when we're in harmony with divine truth. Yep. There's all these physical things that we're no longer afraid of because we now have a correct understanding of all of these things. We understand how the physical universe interacts with us mm -hmm. when we're in harmony with divine truth, when we know God's truth about the matter. So these are all benefits of understanding this one quality of divine truth, that divine truth results in a fearless existence. Mm. Yeah. When you started talking about this quality, you said that divine truth often exposes fear. Mm -hmm. but then you're also talking about the fact that when we embrace it, we don't have any. Yes. And we've also discussed the fact that if a belief controls us through fear, then it can't be truth. Yes. So could you just maybe outline a little bit the difference between exposing a fear or having a fear control us. Because I know for some people they might hear some elements of divine truth and initially it might bring up some fear for them. Yes, yep. certainly. So how's that different to say the belief in reincarnation and karma yep. or something that makes me feel afraid of, oh, you know, I've got to watch what I'm going to do because otherwise I'll come back as a bug kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if we look at uh, what divine truth does and we look at what fear does, perhaps what we need to do is define what fear does first. Mm -hmm. Fears are false beliefs that appear real to us. They, they look real, but they're not real from God's perspective. But they look real to us individually or collectively because of our personal experience. And so we've imbibed them as an emotion. We have an emotion of fear that relates to that particular thing. Now, many times we suppress that fear. We deny its existence. Mm -hmm. We actually say to ourselves that it's normal to have that fear. Justified. Or... And we justify yeah. it, we minimise it and so forth because we believe it's normal to have a fear. So the average person in Australia, which has the 10 most poisonous snakes in the world, the average person here in Australia is afraid of snakes. And they feel justified by that position because we have snakes here that can kill you in two minutes if they bite you. Yeah. That's the fear-based position. That's not necessarily a truth though. The divine truth, once it enters us about that particular subject, we'll start to understand the relationship between the snake and its reaction to the human condition. And therefore we would no longer be afraid. We'll even understand the reaction of so-called toxin or poison to the human condition. Mm -hmm. So if we were ever bitten by it, we would understand the reaction of toxin or poison to the human condition. And in fact, we can get to the point where those kind of things no longer harm us mm -hmm. once we've worked through our fears about certain things. Now, once we understand all of that information, we are no longer constrained by our fear of snakes. So that's from a purely physical perspective. We're no longer constrained by it. We will walk everywhere we want, barefoot, whatever we want to do, and we're not going to be worried that some kind of snake's going to sneak out of the bush and bite us or, and, and we'll die two minutes later or yeah. anything like that because we're no longer constrained by the fear itself. Mm -hmm. The fear itself is what creates the actual um, event in most cases, and it, that's a law, in fact. Fear has to create events in order to trigger itself, mm -hmm. in order to, to cause the release of fear within ourselves. So 
once we understand that particular law from a physical perspective, we would no longer from an emotional feeling perspective. So this has to be an emotional process. It can't be a physical one. From an emotional perspective, we'd no longer be afraid of snakes. Mm -hmm. If a snake all of a sudden crawled over us, we wouldn't jump up and down <laughs> and scream and do all the things that we might normally do. Or what happens a lot here in Australia is that is the man runs out with a spade or an axe or something trying to chop its head off you know, yeah. and so yeah. forth in order to protect his family or whatever. Now, th those kind of events wouldn't happen anymore once we have a complete understanding of God's truth on the matter. Mm -hmm. God doesn't get afraid of any of God's creations. Mm -hmm. And if we're at one with God and at one with God in truth, we would no longer be afraid of any of God's creations either. Yeah. So that's how it affects us from a physical perspective. Yeah. From an emotional perspective, it should affect us as well. Fear is false emotions appearing real. In other words, things that we feel we should feel that are actually got no semblance to reality. So for example, most people on earth are afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. Now, every one of us is faced with death at some point in our, in our future. Mm -hmm. It's a normal occurrence of human life. And if we knew the full truth about death, none of us would be afraid of dying. Yeah. We wouldn't feel the emotion of fear about dying. Mm -hmm. However, because we do not know all of God's truth about the matter, we become afraid of death. We become afraid of dying. And it controls and us. And it controls fear, yeah. our choices, decisions, and many other things in our life. And in fact, in, it is the trigger for many wars even. Yeah. The fact that one group of people is afraid of dying uh, is a trigger for uh, many wars. The attack and also the defence of a country, for example, is often triggered by this fear of death and what's going to happen when we die. Mm -hmm. The feeling of a loss of life and the feeling of a loss of our what we want to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were completely in harmony with divine truth and divine truth encourages a fearless existence, we would not be afraid of dying yeah. because we would know all the truth about death. It's not, it's not that we're trying to no longer be afraid of death. Mm -hmm. It's because we know the truth about death that we're no longer afraid. Yeah. And we don't just know it in our mind, as a lot of people claim to, mm -hmm. but they are still very afraid. You know it in your feelings, you know it in your emotions, so you know it in your heart. That's why you're not afraid anymore mm -hmm. about death. Let's look at it from a spiritual perspective. Now, so we've looked at it physically, emotionally. Let's mm -hmm. look at it from a, a spiritual, spiritual perspective. Yeah. From a spiritual perspective, and this, if we look at spirituality as mostly reflecting our relationship with God, then we would no longer be afraid of God. And we would no longer be afraid of God's laws. We'd no longer be afraid of God's universe. We'd have a more, a strong desire to experience the universe and discover it rather than uh, stepping back from the universe and, and trying to maintain our own little safe place rather than going out into the world. So when we become truly spiritually oriented from God's perspective, we no longer form clans or family systems or cultures or nations because we believe we're all one with each other. Uh, so we're no longer guided though by those particular things. We now have the same amount of love for a stranger as we do for someone, our own child even. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, our actions change quite significantly. This is an indication that our spiritual beliefs are now coming into more harmony with divine truth. So divine truth means, or God's truth means, that we will not be afraid whenever we consider anything. Mm -hmm. Physically, scientifically, mathematically, spiritually, you know, with music, art, science, or any of these other areas of investigation, we will no longer have fear in us once we are truly in harmony with divine truth. Or if we still have fear within us, we will no longer be governed by the fear that's in us. We'll recognise the need to release it, and we recognise the fact that the fear exists because we have some false belief that exists on that particular subject yeah. and not because it's true, mm -hmm. not because it's real. Because from God's perspective, once we are in harmony with God's truth, we will no longer have any fear on any subject. So therefore, no fear is real yeah. after that point. So I, the interesting thing from what you're saying to me is that you're saying that often when we're out of harmony with God's truth, Fear is dictating mm -hmm. our existence. Mm -hmm. And then when we open ourselves to the fact that if fear is dictating our existence, then we, we don't know the truth. 
then we immediately have this, uh, we can engage a process where we say, okay, what I'm believing in can't be true because it's, it's allowing fear to control me. Not only that, what I believe can't be true because I'm afraid. Yes. Once, and, and my belief isn't governed by my intellect. The, if, I, if I'm afraid emotionally, then it means my belief emotionally is very, very different to what I think it is. Does that make sense? Yes, like, it does. So, so it's very much aligned with the emotional experience of the individual, not the intellectual experience of the individual. Yes. So there's a lot of people who believe they don't have a fear in their mind, but you put them in the situation and bang, their fear is automatically present. What I'm suggesting is their fear will not be present in that situation anymore once they understand the, God's truth about it. And that's a process, you're saying. There's, yes. there's a process that we can go through where we, we say, OK, emotionally I'm still afraid, but I know that there's a false belief creating this fear. Yes. Uh, otherwise I wouldn't be afraid. So I can now start to engage a process of desiring God's truth and this might be how my fears are exposed and released. Yes. Great. And in fact, it's the only way by which your fears can be exposed and released. Yeah. As we'll find out, there's another quality of divine truth later that talks about emotion. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so that's involved in this particular uh, understanding in, in terms of how you can correct the problem. But we must understand that fear is an emotion. It's a feeling. It's not something we're going to intellectually be able to avoid. Yeah. And when we're placed in situations, the instant we're in the situation, we will feel it unless there is a different belief in our soul. Yeah that creates a different state within the individual. So, so the beautiful thing about the quality of, this quality of divine truth is it's basically exposing to us all of our false beliefs, whether they are religious, scientific, physical, emotional or spiritual, it exposes all of our false beliefs. Yes. Because once we understand that we wouldn't have fear if we understood the truth, God's truth on a certain subject, then we understand that every time I feel the feeling of fear or I deny the feeling of fear, I cannot be in harmony with God's truth on the subject. Mm -hmm. And this gives me the option now of being able to correct that problem rather than just live in it. See, most of us justify that position and live in it every yeah. single day, in fact. Yeah. And we see it happening all around us all the time. And even most people who still come to our seminars still justify the position of living in fear on a, a large variety of subjects. Absolutely. And this is an indication that this quality of divine truth is not understood at the soul level by them. Once it's understood at the soul level, they'll no longer allow fear to dictate what happens in their life. They might still have some, mm -hmm but they won't allow it to dictate what happens in their life. And they'll understand that every time they have a fear, it stops them from accepting God's truth. It stops them from understanding universal truth. Whether they think they know the universal truth or not, it is stopping them from emotionally feeling that universal truth as a presence in their life. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Great. Um, so maybe we should move on to the second question, but there's just something that you had here in the notes which I thought was... And you, you touched on it briefly when you said that divine truth or accepting God's truth actually opens us to more truth. Mm. And something you've written here in the notes is that if a teaching prevents us seeking more truth, then that teaching is not in harmony with divine truth. Yes. So let's say we have a scientific principle that prevents us from examining more truth mm -hmm. some, for some reason. Then that scientific principle could not be in harmony with God's truth. It's not scientific, in fact. Yes. It has to be based on some kind of emotional experience. If we have an emotional belief that stops us from examining or feeling more divine truth, then that's an indication that that emotional belief must be an error. It's mm -hmm. got to be out of harmony with God's truth. Mm -hmm. If we have a spiritual belief that stops us from examining more truth, so like just a simple belief like the Bible is God's word and there's nothing beyond the Bible, that's what I would classify as a fear-based belief mm -hmm. because it stops us from finding out more truth. Yeah. 
It's basically saying to us that all the truth of God of the whole universe is stored within the Bible. And if you go beyond that, you're going to get punished and you're going to go to hell and you're going to have all these bad things happen to you. And none of it is true, Mm. as is daily demonstrated to us by anybody who doesn't believe in the Bible. The fact is they don't have all those things that are threatened happening to them at that moment or even after they die. And so so therefore it is untrue. Mm. But it is a belief that is stopping us from accepting more truth and therefore it can be thrown out, it can be discarded because all divine truth is fearless. It isn't governed by any fear. It doesn't cause us to get into any fear. And so when when a truth or when we ourselves are fearless, we're always seeking and expanding and always, exploring. Always. So, and we know because God's truth is infinite, which was the first quality we discussed, yep. we know we're always going to be discovering new stuff. So we wouldn't be preventing ourselves from discovering new stuff by having or holding on to a belief system that prevents us yeah. from discovering new things. Yeah. And, and we wouldn't be worried about whether it's in harmony or out of harmony with God's truth. We would soon discover it because mm-hmm. we know that we're, we're not afraid of being in or out of harmony. We, we will just discover it. And once we discover it, then we'll bring our lives into harmony with it. Just, it's just like discovering something physical, you know, like discovering the law of aerodynamics. Once we discovered that, we decided to bring our life into harmony with that as a desire. We didn't go, oh, I'm afraid of that. You know, we weren't dragged, kicking and screaming. Most of us now, can you imagine us in an airport being dragged, kicking and screaming to be sit, sit in a seat and being strapped down and then we go like this the entire time and then we, you know. There probably is a small percentage of the population possibly, that still does that. Possibly, but the reality is <clears throat> the people who do that probably wouldn't fly. Yeah. Most of us fly because we desire to. Yeah. It's easier than travelling in any other way for long distances and so we do it. And, and we choose to do it because that's our desire. This is the beauty of a fearless existence is we finish up choosing to do things that we were previously afraid of mm. once we understand God's truth. You know what I find really fascinating is that the scientific community is often more open to this process of a fearless experimentation yes. than many people in spiritual pursuits and often science and spirituality or science and religion are pitted against each other when actually um, they could really learn about uh, well I feel religion could learn a lot from science because in a and from scientific endeavor and from the scientists themselves just in terms of their attitude yes because the attitude of most religious faith is don't go looking for anything more. God might be against it. You might be punished in your future. After you die, something bad might happen. That's the general attitude of most people in spiritual circles, mm. of religious circles of all kinds. And yet the scientific attitude is, yes, we want to know more about the universe. It's always benefit man by knowing more about the universe. And if we make a mistake, well, we'll just try well, something we'll new. we just try another experiment, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. uh, if we make a mistake. And these are the attitudes that God wants to encourage us to have, Mm -hmm. but which uh, most religious faiths deny that God wants to encourage us to have. And most religious faiths are in heavy fear of, in Mm. fact. Hence, they are constantly criticising any advances in scientific knowledge. Whereas when we become, when we're in harmony with God's truth on the matter, we're not afraid of advances in scientific knowledge. We welcome them because it it just means we're going to have to change on a concept or a belief we have to bring it into harmony with the scientific knowledge we've discovered. So we're not afraid of that. And and we're not afraid of some kind of future events. Mm. So this is the thing like the laws of reincarnation, for example, that people have, which are not laws at all. They're just um, theories. Theories. Most of them are fear-based because they're causing people to be afraid of what will happen, you know, in their future at some point because of what they do now and, and what they've done in the past. There is a law of compensation. There is uh, this idea of penalties or, or, or that we'll see, see and examine as a divine truth, but it's not driven by a fear, a fear of the future. It happens in the instant. Mm. It happens right now. The instant you break a law, a, a truth of God, the instant there's a consequence. You jump off a building and the instant you do that, pretty soon thereafter, you've got the response. And that, and we're not afraid of that. We know that there is this correlation between the law or the truth and the results of the truth. Um, a person who's living in harmony with this principle would have no fear whatsoever about that process. Because it's designed to help us learn more truth. It's de- yes, the whole lot is designed to help us more live more truth, learn more truth, 
live in harmony with more love, learn more love, learn how to look after our personal existence, learn self-responsibility. There's so many things that it's designed. God's laws are all designed into helping us become more personally responsible in our life. And so why would we be afraid of that? We'd want that yeah. if we were truly open to God's truth and truly open to this particular quality of divine truth. Mm. Okay, thank you. All right. Regarding quality eight, what does a soul-based understanding that divine truth results in a fearless existence actually look like in my personal life? Well, if I am not afraid of anything, <laughs> Obviously, there will be very, very large changes to my choices and actions in my personal life. Yeah. From a physical perspective, I won't be afraid of discovering new truths about the universe. So collectively or individually, we would no longer be stopping the discovery process. Mm -hmm. We would no longer be stopping the process of making mistakes and then correcting ourselves based on the measurements we made through making mistakes. We would no longer be afraid of mistakes from a collective or individual perspective. Yeah. So there are many external and internal th changes that would occur if mankind understood at the soul level this, this particular quality of divine truth. We would no longer approve of or accept religious thought that was based around fear. Mm. Either fear of discovery of new truths of the universe from a physical perspective or fear of God or fear of doctrinal uh, errors. We would not be afraid of such things. We would be allowing ourselves to discover new facts about the universe and our presence in it, and new facts about God and everything God has created. Mm -hmm. We'd be constantly involved in the discovery of new facts. We wouldn't prevent it. We wouldn't use resistance or fear or violence or any other thing to, pre to prevent the discovery of new truth. We would always want to discover new truth. We would have an attitude of wanting to discover new truth. We wouldn't be trying to prevent others from discovering new truth just because we don't believe it mm -hmm. at this point in time. We would allow them to go through the process of discovery of new truth because there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> we, would, we would also not be afraid of throwing away false beliefs. We would, in fact, love the fact that we can throw away a false belief. That's one more damaging, controlling thing that we can get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> it is one more thing out of our life that we can allow ourselves to just allow ourselves to get rid of out of our life in such a way that it no longer determines what we choose to do with our life. Yeah. So there are so many positive actions, both collectively and individually, that would be the result if we truly understood this quality of divine truth, that divine truth results in a fearless existence. So if we look at it in four primary areas, we've got the physical area. Mm -hmm. Divine truth results in us not having any more physical fears if we engage the truth about those particular things from an emotional perspective. From an emotional perspective. Divine truth would result that we no longer are terrified emotionally about all sorts of experiences. Yes. You know, we're no longer afraid that somebody, that, that when, some, when our loved one dies, that we're not going to be able to grieve or, in fact, we'll get to the point where we won't even grieve because we know they're still alive because we understand the divine truth about that particular subject. So our emotions will become a lot more settled and calm as a result of understanding this particular truth. In addition, uh, from a spiritual perspective, our belief systems of God, the universe that we live in, are going to substantially change. We won't believe the universe is against us, or God is against us, or God wants to punish us all the time, or we, nor will we feel guilt about past behaviour. We will desire to change past unloving behaviour, but we won't feel this terrible guilt that just nags on us and nags on us that we never release because mm. we realise that's also based around a fear. From a scientific perspective, we would always be absorbing new truth. Mm -hmm. so, so we would not, just because we have a certain religious belief, discount any scientific evidence. We wouldn't do that. If there is mathematical evidence that was presented to us about a certain truth, we wouldn't discount it just because we have a different belief system. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
When it comes to personally, there's going to be huge changes too. We won't be afraid of our emotions. We won't try to control others or their emotions because usually when we do that, we're trying to control how we will feel as a result. Mm -hmm. We won't try to impact upon people we love all the time, trying to boss them around or control them and tell them what to do because we understand God's uni universe is a very safe place actually, much safer than what we've made it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mankind is the most dangerous creature in God's universe and the reason why we're the most dangerous is because we continue to use our will out of harmony with love and that's what makes us the most dangerous creature in the universe currently. It doesn't need to be that way and we understand that once we understand that fear is the cause of most of our beliefs about danger. Mm. We, we no longer are constrained by physical limitations anymore because we have an expansive view of the universe. We're no longer afraid to imagine we're no longer afraid to discover, afraid to make mistakes, afraid to experiment. None of those yeah. things would happen anymore. We're no longer afraid of leaving a book that defines a religious viewpoint when it's blatantly obvious that such a book cannot be all of God's truth. Mm -hmm. We're no longer afraid of leaving it. We just leave it because it's, it's easy to leave. We understand there are certain truths in it and there are certain false things in these books. And we accept the truths and at the same time do not accept all of it as truth. Yeah. And we're not afraid of doing that. We're not afraid that some God is going to come along and punish us for doing that. Mm -hmm. We're not afraid that, we're, that some person is going to come along and punish us, although that's higher, much more highly likely than God doing it. Yeah. <laughs> as I said, I individual <laughs> humanity is the most dangerous creature on earth. That's a potential. But even then we're not afraid of that because we understand God's truth about it. The fact that we have an eternal existence is going to have a huge impact on the, our future choices and decisions. Yep. So there's all these areas that it's going to positively affect us if we truly feel it. Yeah. But we have to feel it before it has any positive experience. Yeah. Can I run through a few examples? You've touched on a few, but mm -hmm. some of them really speak sure. to me being on the other side of this truth. Not that I've accepted yeah. it, but yeah. I see yeah. myself in a lot of these. Sure. So, um, so when we have a soul-based understanding that divine truth results in a fearless existence, we live um, complete, in a completely fearless state. We don't allow fear to dictate how we live our life, even planning and any control of any kind is fear-based. Mm -hmm. um, I don't try to plan my life to control my emotions or my environment. This is a big thing. I feel that what happens with most people is, particularly in the Western yes. world, we have the ability through a, a larger degree of wealth, which often that we've stolen from others mm. in terms of raped other countries to obtain. Um, we have this ability to control the comfort levels that we experience in our personal life. Yes. The problem with control of the comfort levels that we experience in our personal life is that it's based around fear. We're just trying to avoid certain experiences. Mm -hmm. And if we were truly in harmony with God and in harmony with this principle of divine truth, that divine truth results in a fearless existence, we wouldn't make decisions to improve our comfort in order to avoid something. Yeah. We'd make decisions to improve our comfort because we love yeah. ourselves or love somebody else. We would never make a decision to improve our personal comfort while destroying the personal comfort of another mm -hmm. because all of those actions would actually be out of harmony with love yeah. and therefore we would never take those decisions. And also my choice to harm you in order to get something for myself is driven by a fear that I don't have enough myself yeah. or that there's not enough to go around and these are not truths. The reality is God's created an abundant universe. Mm -hmm. And if we understood that, we would have far less fear. So there's, a, there's some major areas that will affect our life there. Yeah, and I agree that most of us in the West are very accustomed to having a large, um, large amounts of control over our environment and mm. our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. and, but often that control is, has been done to avoid certain sets of emotions. And... Often, you know, we see when people have children, for example, or some, some set of events occurs where suddenly they can't have quite as much control, a lot of fears start to get exposed, don't they? Which mm -hmm. shows us that that, that initial um, controlling of our environment happened because we're afraid of certain things. Yes. Yeah. And if you look at the way children learn, even though when they start walking, for example, they're not afraid of falling over, mm -hmm. right? Until and someone goes, <gasps> 
Well, even, <laughs> even then they're often not afraid yeah. of falling out. Otherwise they'd probably never do it. And if they never did it, they'd never walk. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we naturally, as humans from the young age, have this idea that even if we have some negative event that occurs as a result of our desire to know something or do something differently, we are not afraid of it. Fear develops over time. Mm. And usually it's inculcated into the child from the adult or from the adult's environment yeah. into the child. So the child learns it has to be afraid of certain things and certain pains. But when it's little, it's not afraid of feeling pain even because it quite often touches things that causes it to feel pain. Mm. And then 10 minutes later, we'll go and do another thing that causes it to feel pain. It's, it doesn't sit there in a, in a frozen mess emotionally, avoiding every experience because there might be the potential of pain from the experience. Yeah. It doesn't do that. Yeah. We learn that as adults to do that because we don't release the pain that we've experienced. Mm -hmm. And this is a big problem that we face on the planet is that because we don't release past pain, we then now have a fear of future pain which governs our existence. Yeah. So a person who understood this principle would not do that anymore. They would yeah. not let sorry, let the fear of past pain cause them to drag this pain into the future decisions. Mm. They would actually see the separation between past events and potential future events and they would try to correct, they would release the past pain but they would not let themselves focus on the future pain as a potential. They would see that the truth is that God's truth results in a fearless existence and if that's the truth, then we have the prospect of never having any fear in the future, yeah. which means that we would then be willing to release the experience of our past fear. Yeah. We're willing to engage the process of experiencing our fears and experiencing our past pain, whether it be physical or emotional or spiritual in its nature. Mm -hmm. So we'd be willing to go through a process of change once we understood this properly at the soul level. Mm. Well, and that's maybe a couple of other examples from this list. I believe I'm completely able to feel all of my own emotions, no matter how painful. And I feel that's another one that could have a lot of discussion about. Yeah. We, we, we constantly believe that there is a certain level of pain, whether it be emotional or physical, and usually it's emotional, that we're unable to cope with, mm -hmm. that we're unable to experience. That is not a God's, one of God's truth. According to God's truth, all pain is able to be experienced and all pain is able to be released. Yeah. So, so when we have this false belief, we are imposing a fear upon our future life and therefore dictating our future decisions through this fear. Mm. Okay, another one. I feel when I'm living in fear, I'm not allowing the full expression of my own personality. And this is another very important one. Uh, I feel a lot of people uh, do not realise in any single moment that they're not allowing the full expression of their own personality and nature. Mm. In fact, the majority of people are heavily suppressing their own personality and nature because of all the fears that they have that are like, it's like a jail that they've created for themselves. Fear is like this jail that we built for ourselves and we sit inside of it and we think we're protected. Right? Yeah. But it's actually a jail. It's, it's, it's not protection at all. It's, it's a lack of freedom, it's slavery to our fear. Once we see that fear results in a, uh, sorry, God's truth results in a fearless existence, and once we see the necessity of releasing fear, we no longer can, can make this jail for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we start challenging the boundaries of this self-imposed, of, of this self-imposed jail, if you like, yeah. this self-imposed slavery. And we, so we're willing to go beyond our previous experiences in any issue. So if, we're, if before we were afraid of love, now we want to engage love. If before we were afraid of snakes, now we want to pick them up. If before we were afraid of you know, scientific endeavours, now we want to do them. Before we were afraid of learning our own musical instrument, now we want to do it. You know, and, and as a result, we get to discover more about our own personality. Yeah. The main reason why we don't see the true personality of most people is because they're so afraid to develop it due to all of their fears. Mm. And this is a very, very limiting fact about our own personal development. Yeah. Mm. Okay, maybe one final example about what it would look like if I had a soul-based understanding of this truth. I'll not modify myself or my actions 
in order to please others, which is really just avoiding fear. Yeah, so if, if we think about our desire to please others, basically what we're afraid of is we're afraid that they won't be pleased. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so we are afraid that somebody else will do, say, take some action or say something or feel something that is going to be very negative for us to experience if we don't do what they want or mm -hmm. don't do what they believe is correct to do. Now, when we're in a fearless place, we don't do that. We, everything is governed by our desire for God's truth only. Yeah. It's not governed by what everybody else's personal opinion is anymore. Do we want God's truth or don't we? That's the only real decision that we make under those circumstances. And, and so what we do is we're desirous of God's truth. We want God's truth to become known to ourselves. We want to experience it. We want to understand it. We want to feel it rather than going through this process of thinking that other people's opinions really matter. Now, of course, if other people's opinions are more developed in truth, they will have fearless opinions yeah. and therefore they will also help us to become more fearless as we progress in our own opinions and thoughts. But there are many people on the planet who have heavily fear-based opinions mm -hmm. and we would no longer be focused on pleasing those people in order to get some kind of approval or, or acceptance back or even in order to prevent violence, yeah. in order to prevent their attack of us. We will no longer do that because we are fearless in our understanding. And we're fearless in our understanding because we understand that God's truth, absolute truth, the truth of the universe always gives us a more fearless existence. Mm -hmm. That's where it's leading us. It's leading us to this place of fearlessness. Of, and we don't need courage anymore because there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we only need courage going through this experience of releasing the fear. Yeah, I've often felt that courage is really just the willingness to experience fear. Yes, it is the experience, the willingness to feel it and experience it emotionally. Mm. That's what courage is. But we only need courage until fear is gone. It's gone. Yeah. Once fear is gone, you know, it's almost like, well, what does there need to be courageous about? We just <laughs> plough our head because we like it. This yeah. is only desire uh, is causes us to move forward after that point. Yeah. So almost like, because we've developed the quality of courage during the fear-based position, obviously we'll still retain the quality, mm -hmm. but we don't actually need it anymore because there's nothing to be afraid of and we know there's nothing to be afraid of. But you're saying also in that statement that courage is a quality we can develop. Yes. So, and until we reach the place where there's no fear and then it will stay with us, but we yes. won't actually have any fear in us. Anymore. Exactly. So, yeah. so we need to start having courage mm. because of this divine truth that God's truth results in a fearless existence, this principle of God's truth. We, we come to understand internally that actually there's only, we need to develop courage in order to get rid of our fear. Mm -hmm. We need to get rid of our fear through our, our experience. Once we've done that, we realise that this courage will have led us to a new place. And the new place is now where we know. Yeah. We're no longer afraid. We have nothing to be afraid, be afraid of because we know. We know everything we need to know and we live in harmony with the love that exists in the universe and the truth that exists in the universe in that place. And even though we haven't discovered all of God's truth, we now no longer have a fear of discovering God's truth. Yeah. And unfortunately, I see on the planet still there are large barriers to discovering more of God's truth because we have so many fears in so many directions. Mm. Some of them are fears of other people's opinions, fear of our own response, fear of our own emotions, fear of our physical pain, fear of our emotional pain, fear of our spiritual pain, you know, fear of God, fear of the universe, fear of the devil who doesn't exist <laughs> and so forth. We've got so many fears yeah. that govern our, our desire for more truth. And this is why people created books like the Bible, so that nobody would have a desire mm. to discover more truth. It's almost like saying, here's my fear-based creation, yep. a book, and this book is the end of all truth, and that's a fear-based statement, yeah. in fact, and this book is the only part of God's word that exists, and that's a fear-based statement, and these fear-based statements all support my fear-based existence. Mm. And and so many books that have been created, particularly religious books that have been created on the planet, have all been created for the sake of supporting our fears. Yeah. And once we no longer have a fear-based existence, we will find that we will not be bound to these books. Mm. We will not be controlled by them. 
we will not believe the majority of things that are in them anymore. We'll only believe the things that are in them that are actually true, that have been supported by evidence or somebody has verified. Mm. So really this question is about having a soul-based understanding and what that would look like. Mm. But in the previous question you talked about the fact that even hearing divine truth often exposes um, fear within us. Mm -hmm. And from really this whole discussion of these two questions, you're really saying that this is a process of receiving a soul-based understanding of this truth. We're going to need courage to do that, to yes. challenge fear with truth. and Because, actually it, because feel... our fear prevents the truth from ever entering us even. Yeah. That's the thing we need to understand. So it's going to require us opening ourselves up to the experience of fear. Yes, because the only way to get rid of fear is by experiencing it. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, while the fear remains within the soul, truth cannot enter on that subject. Yeah. So what we're going to need to do is be ready to experience fear and release it and will in fact desire this eventually. Yes. I know it sounds crazy, but you will desire this eventually. Yeah. You'll get to the point where you desire to experience fear, terror and release it because you know the terror and fear is preventing you from absorbing emotionally more truth. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, you understand that so much that you're prepared to go through the emotional process of doing it. Yeah. Not only prepared, you want to. <laughs> you know, you're not there going in resistance saying, oh, why do I have to do this? You want to because you realise the importance of it to your future existence. So really, we can accept this divine truth, that divine truth results in a fearless existence. We can receive that and that will then begin to dictate our actions to challenge fear in every area. It, we won't yes. be fearless when, necessarily when we, when we accept this truth or how does but that work? The truth won't enter our soul yep. until we've released the fear. Gotcha. But at least from an intellectual perspective, we are willing to challenge the process. We are yeah. willing to develop some, the feeling of courage yeah. to work through our fears. The, the problem that most people have is they sort of, they want to use the intellectual truth to skip over their fears. Yeah. So what they, well, you know, so when I talk about the fact that there is no thing, such thing as, you know, um, dying completely, you know, that you're always going to have a life after death. Most people now who've listened to us say, Yes, I know that. I have no fear of that. And yet you put them in the situation where they're dying and you see they're terrified. Yeah. And the reason why they're terrified is because it's not yet an emotional feeling within them. Mm -hmm. It's only a thought. And this is the problem is that we cannot, any of these qualities of divine truth, we cannot absorb with our mind only. Our mind can help us to go through an emotional experience to confront them. Mm -hmm but we cannot absorb them with our mind only and expect there to be a change. Mm. The change has to happen emotionally. Yeah. The only way for terror and fear to exit our soul, exit our emotional experience, is by the experience of it. Mm -hmm. If we refuse to experience it, none of the divine truths, even though they are all fearless in their nature, will actually cause a change in us unless we go through the release of the fear-based experience. Yeah, I suppose if I contrast between yourself and myself, you still have fears within you, obviously, yes. you're not one with God yet. Yep. I still have an immense amount of fear and terror within me. Yes. But you've gone through a process of releasing quite a lot of fear and terror. And when I interact with you, I feel that you know the divine truth that divine truth results in a fearless existence because you live your life in a way where you don't try to control your experience or your yeah. environment, yeah. you desire your emotions. Yeah. So you've actually received even a soul-based understanding of this truth. Yes. In this or process. Or connected with that soul-based understanding of the truth yeah. rather than allowing my fear to dominate my intellectual and emotional belief. Yeah. Whereas I'm still coming at it from the place of intellectually agreeing with that mm -hmm. and then needing to challenge the emotional belief, which is, no, nah, exactly. uh, fear is going to keep me safe. And, and this is the emotional belief that stops your progression. It causes yeah. your stagnation, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you know that and aware of that, how much it's causing your stagnation. Yes. And this is the case for the majority of people who hear divine truth. It's their emotional, um, their emotional the, absorption of fear yeah. that's still present within themselves that they're not allowing themselves to experience that causes the emotional rejection 
of divine truth. Mm -hmm. So they have an intellectual acceptance while at the same time having an emotional rejection. And this becomes very confusing and confronting yeah. uh, to have both things at the same time. Because the one thing, your mind is telling you to do one thing, <laughs> but your, your heart, your feelings are telling you to do something completely different. Yeah. Your mind's telling you, don't go down the fear road, don't go down the fear <laughs> road. And your heart's telling you, go down the fear road, go down the fear road. Or <laughs> the other way around, is it? Well, no, oh, while the fear it. remains within the heart. Do what fear says. Do what fear your says. heart's telling you, do what the fear says, do what the fear says, yeah. do what the fear says. And your mind's going, don't do what the fear says. What are you doing? <laughs> this is after you've accepted intellectually divine truth, but mm -hmm. not emotionally. Mm -hmm. Now, the majority of people who have heard divine truth currently on the planet have only done that. They've accepted it intellectually, but not emotionally, because they're unwilling to go through the emotional experience of the release of the fear, mm. the terror. It's one of the hardest emotions to release. The majority of people avoid that immensely. So they, they spend most of their life creating a life to avoid it. Yeah. And so it takes a lot of effort to break down the resistance to feeling the terror that exists within you, you as an individual. Mm -hmm. But once you do, now the divine truth that's in your mind can enter your heart. Yeah. And now the fear no longer governs everything about your your actions and, and what, what you choose to do, choose to believe, choose to accept, choose to act upon. Mm -hmm. you, you're no longer governed by this terror that exists within you because you know you can experience it. You don't even have to have released it completely. You know you can experience it. You've done it many times before, so you know you can do it again. And you know you didn't die doing it. <laughs> you know that things didn't go badly doing it. In fact, you know your life improved. So you now have faith that if you release the terror, then um, the truth will be able to enter you emotionally to such a complete degree that eventually you'll become at one with God on the subject and you'll have no emotional feeling of fear or terror within you at all. Mm. Mm. No matter what the justification was prior, yep. you now no longer have the justification for the fear either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. It's a beautiful quality of divine truth, actually. It is. And, and poorly understood by the majority of people who have even listened to, the, to divine truth on the planet. Mm. And it was very poorly understood in the first century as well. Yeah. Um, most people who listened to divine truth in the first century still had a lot of personal fear. Mm. And until they went through that experience of releasing that fear, then they started to have a lot of courage because yeah. courage develops. The more you release fear, the more courageous you can become because it's easier. Yeah, because you're in a, in a sense, you're not afraid of the experience of fear anymore. No. You might still have it within you, but you know that you can experience it. Yes. And this is where I see a lot of us, myself included, getting stumped yes. where we're, you know, have a few forays into feeling a little bit of fear. Yep. But this this um, faith that that divine truth will result in a fearless existence yep. is is still not well developed. And so our will doesn't get used in that direction. When what I'm feeling more and more is that it's it's a decision of will. How am I going to use my will? Yes. Will I do it in harmony with faith in, in this quality? Because I have to sort of experiment with that and grow my faith. I, mm -hmm. have, some, I have some good experiences with that, mm -hmm. but it's still not entered my soul. No. So, because um, your fear still dominates the experience. It still yeah. dominates your willingness. And the actions that I take daily, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. So would that be your, what would be your advice to someone who has this truth intellectually? Mm -hmm. It hasn't entered their soul. Yep. How, how there is only one best... solution, yep. and that is you must at some point take and make an active choice to actually feel and experience all of your fear and terror. Mm. That's the only way that this is going to change. And that's a soul-based choice as well, so it's isn't it? It's got to be a soul-based choice. An intellectual choice. It'll grow over time. It may grow over time till you get to that choice. You have to confront every single fear-based perspective in order to get to make to that that choice. Mm -hmm. Now, I see both on earth and in the spirit world in the first six dimensions, huge amounts of fear still. There's huge amounts of people in, when I say huge amounts, I'm talking like 30 billion people who are in a state of terror and fear. Mm. And that's a lot of people who are unwilling to feel and experience their own fears. And it also present, prevents every single one of those people from understanding God's truth from an emotional perspective. Yeah. 
So it has such a huge effect mm. on our ability to grow towards God, but also our ability to be happy. Yeah. And, and it is the single most important reason why the earth is in its current condition and why people in the spirit world who have, after they've passed are currently in a condition of unhappiness. Mm. Fear is the most dominant emotion that is retained within the human race still. And while it is the most dominant emotion, it is going to prevent the absorption of new truths. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's, it's very important that all of us recognise the effect of fear in our lives. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Quality nine. What do you mean when you say divine truth does not hurt anyone or anything? <laughs> yes, well, it, there's this common belief on the planet, isn't there, that the truth hurts. Um, yeah. It's in songs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, most people believe it, actually. Most people choose to not have truth because they believe truth hurts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, many people are willing to live lives for the majority of their existence on earth where they don't know the truth about most things. They feel that ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Ignorance is painful, actually. And God's truth is that ignorance is painful and, and certainly not bliss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the reality is that God's truth cannot hurt anybody or anything. And the reason why it cannot is because it is the absolute truth of the universe and it's all based around love. Yeah. So it's always loving. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to hurt anything or anyone with God's truth. Mm -hmm. God's truth is, is of such a nature that, that it always brings more love into the situation. Always. It always brings more acknowledgement of law into the situation. It always brings more truth into the situation. That's the way God's truth is. Yeah. Human truth is often in denial of God's law, in denial of the truth. We want to retain an opinion of our own, which we want to believe is true, but which is actually damaging our existence. Human truth, so-called, when it's out of harmony with God's truth, is actually damaging our happiness. It's hurting us. Mm. And this is the thing we need to come to see, that the real thing that hurts is not knowing the truth, but the error that existed before the truth was known. Yeah. And this is why it's so important for us to have a desire to discover more truth. Yeah. Because if we discover more truth, we will have the potential of feeling less hurt mm -hmm. in our future. If we continue to hold on to errors and therefore hold on to the untruth, what we do is we are now, through the law, there's a, laws involved with all of this, encouraging more hurt. Yeah. We're actually bringing more hurt to us by holding on to the error. And I see that this is a big problem as well. That we, we are frequently believing that the truth hurts when the truth does not hurt at all. Mm -hmm. And it's the error that hurts us constantly that we live in almost constantly and when it gets exposed, of course it hurts. Yeah. And we are unwilling generally to go through the process of the exposure of the hurt. Mm. So we, what finishes up happening is we suppress the hurt, suppress the hurt, suppress the hurt. And we think that not knowing the truth will help us suppress the hurt. But the hurt is having a terrible detrimental effect to our body, to our emotions, to our life, to our attractions, what we attract into our life. And even the detrimental effect in our relationships and particularly our relationship with God. And yet we want to hold on to the hurt. Mm. We're not seeing the truth of what creates hurt. What creates hurt isn't truth. It's error. Mm. And that's the thing we need to understand. So really you're saying it's error, it's lies, it's deceit. All of these things create our hurt. Yes. And sometimes people want to deny those things and they think that's ignorance and that's blissful yes but actually eventually the truth will come along and expose those things yes and it's not the truth that's hurting in those times it's just the exposure of what already existed which was deceit lies, lies. error yeah. false beliefs false those beliefs. kinds of things yeah. exactly and in fact when a person arrives in the spirit world many times they realize that the bliss they thought was ignorance <laughs> yeah. is no longer bliss because, sorry, because um, all of God's truth is, all of God's laws are actually designed to bring us truth, aren't they? So exactly. Even if we control our environment enough while we're here in our physical body, 
as soon as we enter the spirit world, we're going to be confronted with truth, aren't we? Yes, yeah. but it's not only because of that. Yeah. There, are many, uh, and, uh, there are many reasons why a person, once they hit the spirit world, realises that ignorance was not bliss. Mm -hmm. They arrive in the spirit world in usually a terrible condition with a lot of pain associated with it. And now they become completely conscious of their pain and as a result, they, and, and they realise that a lot of their pain was the result of their choice to be ignorant. Yeah. They also find that, th that their choice to be ignorant means that they don't understand where they're now living. Mm. And that causes huge amounts of confusion and f further pain mm -hmm. because they no longer understand the location in which they're living or why they're living in that location and what caused them to be in that location. They don't understand how the universe works and so they don't know how to get out of the location that they're living in. And so the bliss that they thought was created by the ignorance is not created and in fact the opposite has been created and that is more pain and suffering gets created through ignorance. And you can see the reality of this in our physical life quite easily. Whenever we are ignorant of physical things. So for example, the average person on earth you know, hundreds of years ago, was ignorant to the fact that there was such a thing as germs. Yeah. And so what we used to do is things like go to the toilet and eat straight after without washing our hands. Yeah. You know, that was something we were ignorant of. Now, the average person might have smelt their hands and go, well, that's not very nice, right? Uh, and, uh, and done something about it for that reason. But they would not have been particularly concerned about, you know, the fact that there might be damaging effects of those particular germs. Now, the ignorance of that caused their behaviour to be such that they allowed themselves to live in what we would call unsanitary conditions. Yeah. Not understanding that the unsanitary condition caused the multiplication of diseases and viruses and bacteria, which then affected their own life and eventually, and for many, caused their death. Mm -hmm and therefore the separation from their current life. Now, in that small physical example, we can see the ignorance to the fact that there are microscopic organisms that can cause our harm, and the reason for their creation, which is all to do with our own unsanitary behaviour, wasn't known or understood, and so therefore resulted in a large number of deaths. Once we start to understand that, it started to reduce the number of deaths involved with that kind of behaviour because we started to behave differently. It modified our behaviour. And this is the beauty of truth, is that it starts to modify our behaviour. It reduces the hurt. Now that we understand what is the cause between, you know, so we now have a cause and effect relationship. Mm -hmm. We see the effect is the death of for unknown causes, the cause was eventually known in the sense that it was caused by unsanitary behaviour and conditions. Once we correct the unsanitary behaviour and conditions, all of a sudden we have an improvement in the way and in how many people die. And therefore we see this relationship. Yep. The truth gave us more freedom, a longer life, a longer lifespan generally, and also less trauma in death. Uh, as a result of not, have, not dying from conditions that were dramatically caused by viruses or bacteria or other kinds of organisms that could harm us. Mm -hmm. So how could you then say the truth hurt? Yeah. The truth did not hurt. It was remaining in the ignorant, error-based position that hurt. Yeah. And this applies physically, emotionally, spiritually, with all issues in the universe. Yeah. So every single physical scientific issue in the universe will benefit from us knowing more truth about it. Mm. Every single emotional thing that we need to discover will benefit by us knowing more truth about it. Every single spiritual thing in our future life will benefit by us knowing more truth about it. The truth doesn't hurt us. It helps us. It makes us happy. Yeah. It's the error and holding on to the error-based position that hurts us. Mm. Can I... Um put to you a few examples from the notes here. Sure. You've said not being open and telling the whole truth always results in more harm and pain to the soul. And that's sort of relating to what you're saying there, isn't it? 
Well, it not only results in more pain to the soul, but as a subsequent result, more pain to the physical body and the spiritual bodies that are connected to the soul. Yes. So it, by withholding the truth and not telling it in any case, if we know it and we don't tell it, all we're doing is creating more pain and suffering for ourselves mm -hmm. and more pain and suffering for anybody who heard our lie yeah. or could have benefited from the truth that we withheld. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, we wouldn't take such actions if we didn't believe that the truth hurt. We, if, we, if we thought to ourselves, oh, the truth never hurts, we'd go, I'm not hurting anybody. I can go and tell them <laughs> whatever I want. And, you know, that's truthful and I'm not hurting. But, but also I would understand telling a person something that is not demonstrated to be true and not proven to be true can be a dangerous thing. And unless I preface that with, I don't know, or this is my personal opinion, mm -hmm. I'm creating some fictitious truth which the person may then act upon and do something with. Yeah. Now, if people do something because of your personal opinion, well, that, that's okay. That's their personal choice. You've stated up to the front that that's your personal opinion and that's okay. But if people do something because you're telling them it's the definite God's truth yeah. and yet it's not, and then they take actions that they will be harmed by in the future, then a lot of that pain is going to be on your head personally as well on through the soul, laws, really. on your soul. Yeah. And, and you're going to feel the pain of that as well. So it's a very dangerous thing to tell people so-called ideas or concepts that you do not know are true and you need to understand that it's dangerous and also tell people, no, this is my personal opinion. This is not what I know for certain. Mm. Right? So there's a lot of things that are my personal opinion that I don't know for certain. And when people ask me my personal opinion, I tell them because they've asked. But I tell them, this is my personal opinion. I don't know that for certain. Yeah. When I know something for certain, I say, no, this is God's truth that I have discovered through experience and I know that for certain. And then I tell them those particular things. And I know I can do so with no fear of them ever being hurt by it. Yeah. Because I know that God's truth always results in less hurt. Yeah. It always results in more power to the individual and to us collectively. Mm -hmm. It al always results in more love being on the planet. It always results in a happier existence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. All right, um, some other examples now just about emotional pain. Mm -hmm. So. You've got here, if we reject truth because of potential pain, we are choosing to remain in emotional error. Mm -hmm. So you've already sort of covered that, haven't you? Yes, what we're really saying to ourselves in that place is that the truth causes pain. Mm. That's really what we're saying. So if we reject truth because we're afraid that we'll have to feel some pain, we're really saying that it's the truth that caused my pain. Yeah. And we see this happening all the time, don't we, in our seminars Definitely. and stuff. When people come up and say, what's the truth about this? You start telling them and they go, I don't want to know. You know, <laughs> you can feel in them they don't want to know. That is their belief, their false belief that the truth hurts. Mm -hmm. Coming to the fore, it's an emotion that they have, that the truth does hurt. It's yeah. not the truth that hurts, it's the error that the truth exposes that's hurting them. And they need to be willing to experience the error and the emotions associated with the error, if yeah. they're going to ever be free of it. Now, most people are not willing to go through that. They want to hear a truth without ever having it be absorbed in their heart. They believe that they can force it into their heart while the error still remains mm. in their heart. It's not possible. It's just a not, not possible thing. And there, there's another fundamental principle of divine truth, which we'll look at later, which actually says it's not possible. Yeah. But... It's not possible and every time they attempt to do it, they're basically reinforcing their own belief system that the truth hurts yeah. and they become afraid of the truth, yeah. which is also an indication, as from our previous discussion, that fear is not in harmony with God's truth either. Yeah. So that's an indication that there's something wrong. Mm. Every time we feel afraid of truth, there's got to be something wrong with our belief system about truth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And some of those things would be... Uh, well, we often feel the emotional pain of truth entering us because we believe error, which hurts to release. Can I say that we don't feel the emotional pain of truth entering us because there is no emotional mm. pain associated with truth entering us. There's only emotional pain associated with error leaving us. Yeah. 
-hmm. When somebody tells us the truth, it exposes the error and we start to feel it. That means we're starting, it's starting to leave us. Yeah. Once we start to feel it, it's leaving us and therefore we will have some pain. Now, usually the two events are very closely aligned with each other. Yeah. Somebody tells us the truth and the emotional train is instantly triggered. And if we allow it, we start receiving, feeling the error. Mm -hmm. But if we don't allow it, we'll start believing that the truth caused our pain, our pain. which yeah. is not true because it's impossible for truth to cause our pain. And that really indicates that we want to hold on to our pain, doesn't it? Or we our do. error. We do. We're saying no more truth because I don't want this. I want to hold on to this rather than experience it. Yes, and the main reason why a person wants to hold on to error is because they're unwilling to go through the emotional process mm -hmm. of releasing the error. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a point of personal unwillingness. It's got nothing to do with the truth hurting. Yeah. It's a point of their personal resistance that they have to letting the error leave them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we release emotional error, hearing divine truth will only bring us peace, happiness and bliss. Yes. So once we get to the point where we release the error on a certain subject, on a certain matter, we can absorb all sorts of divine truths about that particular subject without any resistance anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no pain associated with it either anymore because the error which caused the pain has gone yeah. because we chose to experience it. Yeah. So if we use some examples there yeah. of a partner telling... Maybe we can use the examples in our next session. Sure, yeah, sure, next absolutely. Session. I've put them in the wrong yeah, sequence that's, there. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right, the final thing you have written here... Mm -hmm is that there are emotional penalties for wanting to believe lies in order to avoid emotional pain. Yes. Perhaps that's quite the dramatic thing to end our discussion on. <laughs> yes. Many times we want to believe the lie. The main reason why we want to believe a lie is because we are trying to avoid some emotional pain of what will happen when we have to accept the truth. Mm -hmm. And the emotional pain is a result of the error leaving us, that we don't want to leave us. Yeah. And so what we do is we manage it. And the way we manage it is we choose to continue to believe the lie in order to avoid the emotional pain mm -hmm. of the error leaving us. Mm -hmm. And this is a terrible thing that happens with, the, with belief systems, religious belief systems, scientific belief systems, uh, political belief systems and all sorts of belief systems on the planet, even down right down to belief systems about our personal emotions. We are constantly trying to manage the pain within us without releasing it. Yeah. This is a major flaw in our desire. We need to understand we, we will not be able to manage our emotional pain eventually mm -hmm. because in our emotional pain we make choices that then cause us to attract more emotional pain and therefore more error. And the more this cycle continues, the error will build to such a point that we'll have a huge amount of pain to yeah. experience. And it would be very, very difficult for us to experience it. There are many people who have lived for thousands of years in the spirit world now who have yet to engage the process of experiencing their emotional pain because their emotional pain is so great because of their choices mm -hmm. to avoid. Mm -hmm. Now, truth will help this process. Yeah. And so it is very important for us to understand we need to let the truth do its work. Yeah. And the truth will bring us happiness. Mm. So you're really saying that when we make the choice to believe lies, not only are we leaving the emotional pain or that's already existing within us unexposed and therefore unable to be healed, mm -hmm but we're actually accruing more emotional pain. Of course, because we're making choices based on ignorance, which means we're breaking many of God's truths or God's laws. When we break many of God's laws, there is the subsequent effect of those laws telling us we've broken them, that there is some kind of result for breaking them. That increases the amount of pain that we're in to show us that we're actually making choices that are out of harmony with love, out of harmony with truth. So there's this cycle that occurs, that, that continues to build up to touch an intensity that we no longer want to make any choices yeah. that are out of harmony with love. Yeah. That's the purpose of the system. Yeah. But many of us take many, many years to get to that point because we detune from the emotional experience of the pain. We're trying to avoid the pain constantly. If we were very sensitive to the pain and allowed the experience of the pain, 
it's highly unlikely we would make another choice which would result in more pain. Mm -hmm. So, so it, there is a benefit to allowing ourselves to become more sensitive to the emotional pain that's caused by error, not by truth. Yeah. We need to allow ourselves to benefit by being more sensitive to the emotional pain, allowing ourselves to experience the emotional pain, which is the result of the error that's within us that needs to exit us somehow, it needs to get out of us somehow. And once that happens, when the truth comes to us, it will be like, ah, oh, it's just a breath of fresh air. It's beautiful, you know. It's, it creates happiness. Yeah. We won't be resistive to it under those circumstances. Mm. Our resistance to truth is driven by our fear of experiencing our emotional pain. Yeah. Now, if we really understood God's principles here, we'd understand that fear results in, a, in, in more pain. Yeah. We'd understand that fear is in opposition to God's truth. Yeah. And we'd understand that hurt is in opposition to God's truth, but both need to be experienced in order to be released. Yeah, my God's helped me with something recently uh, where I was feeling quite stuck around a certain group of fears and certain issues in our relationship. And they said to me, well, just you're feeling stuck around these emotions, but if you just keep desiring truth, speaking truth, um, wanting truthful interactions your emotions will be exposed. You won't have to worry about this issue anymore. No. And I can vouch for that. That yeah. definitely has worked mm. um, to get me over this hump where I just felt very stagnant. Uh, just even praying to be open or praying for to receive more truth and making the commitment to just being absolutely truthful, even about my error-based position with myself and with others mm. really helped me to begin to release some of these errors. Yes. Yeah. After a while, we start seeing that all of our resistance is caused by our fear of pain, yeah. whether that pain be physical or emotional. Yeah. All, and, and fear is not the result of God's truth. And pain is also not the result of God's truth. No. Both are results of errors being expressed as truth, yeah. errors that we believe are true but are not. And if we embrace this process of desiring truth, the errors begin to lead us and we do begin to experience more peace, more direction, more desire, more exactly. happiness. Exactly. Yeah. Even yeah. just uh, acknowledging the truth that you're under attack or acknowledging the truth that there's a potential of violence towards yourself and acknowledge have a, has a freeing effect upon the person, not, not a sla enslaving effect. Yes. So often the things, the truths that we're trying to deny are actually... If we, if we accepted them, would actually free us from the fear and free us from the hurt. Yeah. Which yeah. is, which is a, it's a, so I see it as a sad thing that the majority of people still do not understand this relationship between pain and error. Mm. They believe pain belongs to truth, yeah. not to error. Yeah, it's sad. And that's very sad because pain does not belong to truth. They also believe fear belongs to truth. That's why they want to remain ignorant. Fear does not belong to truth either. No. And these are things that we need to come to understand. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you.